Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Big Tent USA. My name is Gail Shields Miller, and I am a friend of Big Tent. Big Tent is building a women-led voter coalition to protect the guardrails of democracy, ensure government accountability and transparency, and increase civic participation. Before we begin, um, I want to go over some upcoming events that are happening at Big Tent. Uh, the first is a tent talk on Tuesday, May 2nd at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're excited to welcome back Sylvester Johnson, the third of Vote Riders. And the second is another tent talk on Tuesday, May 16th at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The editor in chief and managing editor of the content team of Ballotpedia, the online encyclopedia of American politics, elections, and policy will be with us to discuss the growing use of citizen ballot measures, why they are important, and trends they are seeing around the country. I'd also like quickly to mention there's an option down below on your screen for anyone who wants to use live audio transcript of all the speakers. So tonight, I have the great pleasure of introducing Charlie Sykes and Rick Wilson. Charlie Sykes is a founder and editor at large of The Bulwark, host of The Bulwark podcast and an NBC, MSNBC contributor. He's also the author of 10 books, including How the Right Lost Its Mind, released in October 2017. Charlie has written for every prestigious publication you can think of, including the New York Times, The Atlantic, The Weekly Standard, The Washington Post, and more than I can think of myself. Charlie serves as the president of Defending Democracy Together and sits on the advisory board of the Democracy Fund. Rick Wilson is a renowned political strategist, infamous ad maker, writer, speaker, and political commentator. In December 2019, Rick co-founded the Lincoln Project, a political action committee dedicated to the preservation, protection, and defense of democracy. Rick has authored two New York Times bestsellers, including Everything Trump Touches Dies. Rick writes for the Washington Post, Politico, Rolling Stone, The Hill, The Bulwark, and also regularly brings his unique insights to national cable audiences and international news outlets. I'd like to now turn the call over to Kitty Douglas of Big Ten, who will moderate the conversation between Charlie and Rick. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Gail. Thank you, Charlie, and thank you, Rick, for coming to Big Ten. We're so, so grateful. So let's get, let's get going. Um, so the Lincoln Project and the Bulwark have been so successful in their messaging and in defining the terms of political engagement. The word fascism is being used quite a bit on the news and in print media. We, are, we even use it in our email invitation tonight. So for you, Charlie and Rick, I'd like you each to weigh in. What do you think that term means? And do you think that those words are the right ones to describe this moment in America? Um, Charlie, I'm going to give it to you. Well, I was going to defer to Rick on on that one um, <laughs> oh, because uh -huh. I, you know, you know, I mean, you know, since this is a you know somewhat of a private conversation, um, you know, yes, it's an appropriate word, and, and it's very difficult to understand a lot of things that are happening without going back and rereading the history of the 1930s. I've learned more about the MAGA world by reading Hannah Arendt than virtually anything that's being written today. Um, so, um, and, and especially w when we're talking about Donald Trump himself and Trump's personal message and the personal symbolism that he is embracing, you know, the, I am your retribution, I am your justice, you know, I am the ultimate, uh, you know, manly man on, on the, on the white horse, um, that is textbook fascism. Having said that, here's my caution that, you know, with words like fascism on, on the left and communism on the right, at a certain point, it becomes white noise, and it becomes a term for everything I, do, I don't like. So I, I remember a couple of years ago, I was uh, watching reruns of The West Wing, and there was a, a very, very charming episode where, I, where a young woman was, was debating, they were debating uh, school choice, and she used the word fascist to describe supporters of school choice. And that was the moment where you go, 
okay, I'm not sure that word means exactly what you think it means. But I do think it's important to look at the historical parallels, but also to recognize that uh, you know what we're fighting here is this fundamental illiberalism. I mean, whether we whatever whether we use the F word or or not, there is a fundamental attack on the very idea of America, the idea of self governance, the idea of the exceptionalism of the American founding, all of those things. And I will say this though, one of the problems, and since you call yourself a Big Ten. I think it's worth acknowledging that there's an there's illiberalism on the left as well as illiberalism on the right. And when we talk about defending democracy, what we actually mean is defending is defending liberal constitutional democracy. And we can't defend liberalism, small l liberalism. We can't confront illiberalism like we're seeing from the MAGA world without also confronting the illiberalism on the left. And an analogy that I found very helpful recently from a much smarter guy than, than I am, he said, okay, these threats are asymmetrical. They're not the same thing. What we're seeing from Donald Trump and MAGA is a heart attack. We need to focus on it. It is a heart attack. The illiberalism of the left, though, is more like cancer. So we can't ignore it. We can't downplay it. We can't confront it because... That illiberalism on the left will often be used to supercharge the liberalism on the right. I'm sorry to go too far on all of this, but I do think that that analogy of distinguishing uh, the various threats, that right now, the threat that we're getting from fascists like, like Donald Trump is a heart attack. All of our efforts should be focused to reviving the, the patient, to dealing with it, but don't downplay or enable um, the folks who are also. Uh, you know, att attacking the liberal uh, liberal idea, but in terms of the use of language in politics, there's nobody better in America to talk about that than Rick Wilson. So I'm just going to sit back and listen to the master here. <laughs> well, thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Kitty. Look, fascism is a term that has was thrown around in a, in a prior decade, in prior decades, loosely. Yeah, and right. it it missed a lot of the actual generative formational aspects of fascism that we saw emerge in the 1920s and 30s in Europe. Now, one of the hallmarks of fascism, and I want to step away from Nazism and just focus on, on Italian fascism for a second, which is sort of the, the, the alpha of fascism, the personality cult, mm -hmm. the only I can fix it. I am your leader. I am your retribution, as Charlie was going through Trump's recent promises. It was also very much about the use of state power to ensure that selected businesses and individuals benefited from the use of state power. Mm -hmm. And that if an organization or a business deviated from the beliefs of the government and from the beliefs of the dear leader, they would be punished by the power of the state. I'm, I would like to introduce you all to Ron DeSantis. <laughs> you are seeing a perfect case of authoritarian statism, call it fascism, uh, in Florida right now, where if if someone defies one of his pieces of legislative desire, he is going to go after them with all the power of the state. What fascism does is puts the leader and the state in a primary position over individual liberty, over democracy, over constitution, over the republic. And so it is an appropriate term it's a it, it's a blunt instrument <clears throat> because saying authoritarian statism 50 times a day is a lot of, a lot more of a pain but it is a real yeah. movement in the world of authoritarian uh ambitions not just here but in Hungary and 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 a, and in a number of other places abroad where we have seen either candidates or movements or or actual elected officials begin to use that toolbox from the 20s and 30s again and what you're seeing in Florida, what you're seeing in Tennessee, what you're seeing in Missouri, um, you you can look at those states and draw a very clear um, lineage back to the kind of activities they're pursuing to the fascist movement in Europe in the 20s and 30s. It, it is it's an appropriate word. It's not always the 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 most felicitous term, but it is the most correct term of what they're what's going on on the right side of the spectrum right now. Okay, that was helpful, not heartening, but helpful. Um, and I do- I'm a ray of I sunshine, do, Kitty. Not, not, not heartening. <laughs> Thank you, Florida. 
Um, I, uh, I want to, I, Charlie, I appreciate you bringing up the um, illiberalism on the left, but as you said, right now, we are going to focus on the illiberalism of the right because this is the heart attack moment. But um, I appreciate the fact that you mentioned that it, it gets used right. by the right pretty effectively. So right. because of that, I sort of, I would like to sort of dial in on what's going on in the States because as David Pepper says, these are the laboratories of autocracy. So, and you guys live in some pretty interesting states. So Rick, since you brought up Ron DeSantis and I'm, a, you're, you know, Disney and um, Disney has filed a suit against DeSantis today, which was exciting to see on my phone. So let's talk about your states and where they're at. So Rick, maybe you can start off with um, what's going on in Florida. Can we save Florida? Can we help Florida? And then Charlie, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the Wisconsin Supreme Court race. Sure. You know, and also like this, well, anyways, we'll go into Wisconsin after. Rick, take it away. Well, the bad news about Florida is this. The Democratic Party of Florida cannot get six people around a table at a Waffle House, and they cannot organize a two-car motorcade. They are the single worst major statewide party in the country by an order of magnitude. Their incompetence is so spectacular, it defies human imagination. And the flip side of that, the worst news, is that it is the single best Republican party in the country. They are brutal. They are brilliant. They are organized. They have money like you cannot imagine. They have super majorities in both houses of the legislature. And they have gone to abuse that power at a level this year that has stunned even conservatives now are getting a little nervous in the background saying, oh, man, maybe DeSantis is going a little too far with some of this stuff. Um, Florida is a red state. It is a cause the Democrats have, they, they haven't had a statewide official um, at the in the governor's office uh, since, uh, you know, parachute pants and Nokia phones were popular. It is a long, long time. It's a long, hard road. And they can't get their act together because they misread Florida. And Florida is, a, again, a red state. You are not going to win here with AOC. You are not going to win here with the squad. You're not going to win here in the vast majority of the state um, unless you find a way to get back and have a centrist, uplifting, enthusiastic, optimistic message. And right now, you know, the, the, the last Democratic candidate that ran was was talking about how climate change was going to drown everyone in 20 years. Not exactly, you know, the, the most heartening battle cry. And what you've seen is a Republican Party that has been in power since the 90s, mid-90s, when the Senate came to a tie in 94. <clears throat> And the House, a few years later, was taken over by the Republicans. It has been a long, deliberate 20-year plan, 25-year plan, to destroy the Democratic Party of Florida. The plan worked. I know the guy that wrote it. Um, I was one of the young guys that was executing on it in the 90s to take away their farm team, to divide them, to push the progressives further out to the left so they would be unelectable. It worked. The, 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 there's not a lot of good news about Florida right now, except actuarially speaking. The white hot core of the Republican Party of Florida are a lot of people who came here to have a warm place to die with low taxes. It is, it is a very top heavy party in terms of demographics. Um, you still have the remaining silent generation voters in that, in that cohort. You have the you know, older boomer voters in that cohort. Um, and you have younger, pissed off, lower middle class ex voters in that cohort, um, and they're all getting older. And and you know, I, I speak as a early ex gen <laughs> voter. Um, this is a state that will change demographically in a radical way in the next twenty years. You will see a die off of the most passionately conservative MAGA voters that you can find anywhere in the country. These are people right now in the state of Florida. I'll give you a quick example of why it's so crazy. Mike Flynn has moved here because why not? Everyone else seems to. Um, and he is now organizing folks in Sarasota um, to go out and make sure that the MAGA candidates are defeated by QAnon candidates. Oh, okay. He's making sure that the, 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 the MAGAs aren't pure enough. So you know, we had the old Republican Party that I worked for. Where I was the field director for George Herbert Walker Bush in 1988 when I was a young man with more hair. Um, we had the, the, that party was eaten by the Tea Party. 
The Tea Party was eaten by the MAGA party. And now the MAGA is being consumed by the QAnoners and the ultra MAGAs and the real crazies. That is going to push a lot of voters in Florida further and further out of the Republican pool. As that older generation uh, passes on, you're going to see a younger Florida appear. The question is, can Democrats figure out a way to get out of the ditch politically, stop campaigning on things that don't work, and get themselves into a fighting posture where they can register voters, which they don't do, where they can advocate for smart policies that make sense to Floridians, which they don't do. Uh, and my criticism, it's tough love, folks, but it's the truth. And you're not going to fool yourself <clears throat> into elected office. You got to work your way up. That's where Florida's at. Well, I mean, don't hold back, Rick. <laughs> uh, there was a really good question in the chat about Maxwell Frost. Uh, how do you see his political future? And is that kind of the right message for Floridians from a young, uh, you know, newly elected rep? Look, Maxwell Frost is a good performer. <clears throat> and that, ma that, that counts. That matters a lot. Um, he's good on TV. That matters a lot. When you have of the nation's um, of the nation's 50 largest media markets, 18 of them are in Florida. So, you know, you've got a lot of juice for a guy like Maxwell Frost to get out and be a good communicator. Um, I will tell you, he's a little too progressive to be elected statewide right now. Um, but he can work on that. And and I will say that the that he's been very smart in presenting himself. He's been a very good, very good um, media savvy player in Congress. I like him a lot. Um, and I think he's got a an understanding of the rules of the game as they exist today, rather than the old rules of the game, which were wait your turn, shut your mouth, you'll talk when you're you'll talk when you're in your fourth term. He's he's playing by by the modern rules rather than the imaginary like tradition. Okay. Oh, well, that's good. And if anyone really cares about Florida, check out Me Vecino. It's a great uh, voter good registration guys. organization. I know you guys support the Malinka Project does. So take a look at them. Okay, Charlie, it's your turn. Uh, you just had a big Supreme Court race. And I want to read you a quote that was on Twitter from your former governor, mm -hmm. um, Scott Walker. And he <laughs> says, younger voters are the issue. It yeah comes from years of radical indoctrination on campus, in school, with social media and throughout culture. We have to counter it or conservatives will never win battleground states again. I'd love to hear your thoughts on what Scott Walker had to say and where you think we're at in Wisconsin. Okay, well, uh, first of all, I, I think he's half right there. Um, he's right that something really remarkable happened in this, uh, the Supreme Court election in Wisconsin. Young voters came out in overwhelming numbers. I mean, you look at the wards um, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, La Crosse, Green Bay, Milwaukee. You had, um, you know, big numbers of young people turned out to vote, and they voted 85, 90, 92 percent for the progressives. I mean, this was a real shock for a lot of the uh, of the Republicans. And understand, uh, this was a race for everything. I mean, everything was was at stake. The entire Walker uh, legacy is at stake. The question of abortion, gerrymandering. Nobody was complacent about this election. It was the most expensive judicial election in state history. Turnout was huge. Back in the day, um, if somebody would have said. There are, uh, you know, roughly 1.8 million votes. Um, I think Republicans would have felt, uh, you know, reasonably confident. But but the the turnout uh, formula has changed dramatically. So Walker's right that they have a crisis with the youth vote. Um, he's wrong, uh, rather fundamentally wrong, in not understanding what's actually happening. He's thinking that this is college indoctrination as opposed to maybe it's your message and the things that you are doing and saying that are contributing to this. Now, one of the reasons why he's pushing this, is he's, he's now the president, he's got his own gig as the president of the Young America's Foundation. So he has to shake down, you know, elderly conservative donors and say, you know, give me money and I will deliver young voters to you. Well, that hasn't been working, has it? Um, you know, the right has invested massive amounts of money in groups like that and in Turning Point USA. And um, what you're seeing is this massive shift. Now, Wisconsin, in many ways, is like Florida, but in some ways, it is exactly the opposite of what Rick just described. Because back um, back in the day, in the in the before times, when I uh, was uh, much more familiar with the state Republican Party and the state Democratic Party apparatus, 
you had one of the best Republican parties, one of the most effective turnout machines in the country here in Wisconsin. When Reince Priebus was the chairman of the Republican Party in Wisconsin, they they really had a machine. Paul Ryan funded it. He was put out of the brains behind it. Democrats were absolutely terrible, um, at it, which is why they kept losing those elections, why in 2010, Wisconsin flipped so decisively, more decisively than any other state in America, from blue to red. That has now been reversed. I would argue that the Democratic Party in Wisconsin may be one of the best in the country. They have a, they have a, a new chairman, an executive director, who has figured it out. He understands the kinds of candidates that they need to run. He understands the, the mechanics and, and the messaging. So you have one of the best Democratic parties. Uh, the Republican Party is going through exactly what Rick has described, where you have a completely, not just magnified grassroots, but I mean, just the, 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 the crazification of the Republican Party, which is, which is a massive story in swing states like Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, where, where Republicans were very, very competitive until relatively recently. And one of the main reasons is, is because the Republicans become increasingly extreme. I was talking to a very prominent Republican here who was, uh, we, had, we had lunch and I, I began the conversation like, if only you had been warned. Um, but he's like, Charlie, you know, you may not have noticed, but these people are losing their minds. Yes. Yeah, I get it. You know, but um, it's, it has become so deep. And it's not just Fox News. It's not just it, it's you know people will will you know have these the wildest conspiracy theories, QAnon conspiracy theories, and the elected leaders of the state will say, well, where do you get that idea? And they'll say, well, you know, RisingPatriot.com YouTube channel. I mean, you, they can't they can't track it down. But on this Supreme Court election, um, this is one of those elections where um, off, often I think the national buzz is overhyped. Uh, not this time. Uh, this was a big win. This is a very closely divided state. Uh, the progressive candidate won by 11 points. She was not a great candidate. She was not a strong candidate. And Rick was describing, um, you know, earlier, you know, I think, um, uh, you know, the how the, the right has really weaponized uh, the crime issue. And they pounded her. I mean, if you are sitting here where I'm sitting, you turn on the news and it's back to back to back to back ads all about how this person's soft on crime. This person is you know, for defund the police, everything. It didn't work in Wisconsin. It didn't work because the abortion issue has scrambled the electoral uh, map so decisively. And so what, what Scott Walker is looking at is he's saying, OK, so the Democrats have figured out how to turn out young people. The Democrats have figured out how to lower the margins um, in the suburbs. They are hemorrhaging women, suburban women in Wisconsin. And in a state where the presidential election may be decided by 20,000 votes, I mean, that's that's a cataclysm for them. So in many ways, it's very different from what's happening in Florida, although you still have the same you know, extremism. Um, and you and you also have the, the arrogance. And now, can I just comment on one thing that's happening in Florida in the, these legislatures? I mean, you know, since we were talking about you know historical parallels, it's not new that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And what you're seeing is all of these states that have these super majorities in the legislature, you know, through gerrymandering, whatever, and they're telling themselves that they have to go to ramming speed. That 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 you know what is the point of having a supermajority if you cannot crush your enemies unless right. you can you can push through the most extreme legislation. So in Florida, you're seeing what they're doing. In Tennessee, they expelled I mean, one of the dumbest things I've ever seen. Expelled these two African American representatives. You're seeing it in places like Missouri as well. So it is this sort of out of control political moment. We have the power. Let's use it, you know, as a, as you know, because you know, if not now, then when. That is also feeding into the polarization and the extremism of our politics. So I'd like to pivot to the crazification and the extremism. Um, and Rick, I'm going to turn to you on this. Uh, I was thinking it'd be kind of interesting to unpack, you know, just what um, one of these cudgels that Charlie was talking about how it gets used and how it plays out for the electorate. Mm -hmm. uh, let's 
stay in Florida. And I was going to bring book banning into the conversation sure. because it just seems, um, obviously it's a very, you know, tried and true fascist technique, but also it's something that seems to really have taken off from Florida and Ron DeSantis and, you know, right. anyway, so I'd love to hear a little bit of your thoughts about um, how that works on the ground in Florida and for MAGA. So one of the most profound drivers of Republican voter behavior is a sense of outrage, a sense of aggrievement, a sense of rage that elites are telling them what to do. Our friend Tom Nichols is very, very brilliant about this, this point, but it is it, it could, you should never look away from the fact that for the last 25 years on Fox and elsewhere, as Charlie pointed out correctly, it's iterating out way beyond Fox. It's now on Telegram channels and Discord chats and Rumble and weird things you've never heard of before, um, where they get exactly a, right. an alternative hermetically sealed view of things. And what they've been told for the last several years plays into this central part of this massive strategy to split away the Republican and the conservative movement into a separate society. And that is that teachers and schools are trying to indoctrinate your kids to be gay communists. And, and, and that's, that's to put it very bluntly what they're doing. They'll dress it up a little bit in fancier language and say, yeah. we're just, a, we just want parents to have rights. Well, in Florida, what Ron DeSantis did was pass the notorious don't say gay bill. Well, what that did, this, so-called parents' rights bill, it empowered any idiot, and many parents, God love you, I've been a parent myself and I've been an idiot as a parent, many parents parents are idiots, and the MAGA parents believe that if their children are exposed to an idea, it, they will become that idea. If they read a book about someone who's gay, they will become gay. If they read a book about someone who's a radical, they will become a radical. Well, this is a, the curiosity uh, of this is that Florida has now banned books about Rosa Parks. Process that for one second. Florida has banned books about Rosa Parks, that dangerous Antifa radical Rosa Parks. They have banned books about Martin Luther King, about Anne Frank, about Hank Aaron. This is a, this is a monster that will feed itself. The local areas, the local school boards have been taken over in many places by the Moms for Liberty movement. That is funded by partly by the DeVos fortune, but also largely by a bunch of far-right billionaires who seek to destroy public education at scale. Um, they've just passed a, or they're about to pass, excuse me, a higher ed bill in Florida that destroys university education. It takes away tenure. It doesn't allow arbitration. It has the boards of trustees of the schools who are appointed by the governor will determine hiring and curricula for all academic positions. Now, most of the people that Ron DeSantis has put on the couple college boards so far, I would not trust them to run a discount tire super center, much less a university. Yeah. You are going to see the consequences of this is that, is that the quality of education in Florida is going to fall and fall dramatically. Test scores are falling already. Um, they're banning, or banning advanced placement tests uh, about African-American history. So Florida students will be less competitive nationally. This is a, th this illiberal moment in the Republican party that is driven by, by, by this sense that the elites are trying to condition their children and change them in some way, as opposed to broadening their view of the world and the universe. It is a powerful driver with the MAGA world because they don't want to live in modernity. They don't want to live in reality. They want a, 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 a hermetically sealed, um, a ma mostly imaginary bubble of warm, safe Christian values, even though most of them don't live by any of those values. And, and it is, it is an enormously troubling and, and concerning moment we're in because there is no effective pushback against it so far. Um, litigation is coming in a lot of these things, but that's going to take seven, 10, 12 years. It's not going to be something that, that there's a generation of students in Florida who are about to be deprived of a, of a life that, that, um, that would be enriched by a more broad uh, and humane education, but they're not going to get that. So can I ask you a question? How do we, I mean, it, when you see polls like book banning polls so poorly, yeah. 
how do we use this as a way, you know, as a counter, like, you know, if you let, if elect a pro-democracy candidate, you're not going to have book bans. You won't have teachers afraid to talk about anything really, slavery or, you know, <laughs> right. how do, can we do that, Rick? How do we do that? You're Look, the, uh, the, the sad part of this is, is that the intensity is on the wrong side of the equation. Um, those are people, the people that believe you should ban books from schools, that's all they believe in, because they believe it is a culture war seeking to destroy their values, their ways of life, uh, to break apart their families, and it's all based on a on a series of insane fantasies. And that, but that they they are they are so intense on that question. Now, I will say, when you talk to normal voters, when you talk to oh, the the, the, the large center of America, you are able to make that case, and and you you should lead with it the way I led with it. Because they're going to say, oh, we're just banning books about pornography and pedophiles and gays. They're banning books about Rosa Parks and Anne Frank and Hank Aaron and Martin Luther King. That's how you lead into it. You're, they're closing the minds of children in the state, not because they not because they have some legitimate concern, but because of their fear. It's it, But it's it, the intensity in that question is very much on the other side. Um, but it is part of a broader desire by folks on the right to, to remove expertise and education and knowledge from the political debate. And it should terrify any relatively advanced culture that there's a part of their society that wants to go backwards in knowledge and not forward. Okay, Charlie, this is for you. Well, can um, I can I weigh in on this? Oh yeah, please I, okay, do. I'm, please do. I am here. I'm, okay. Um, I, I know. I know. <laughs> um, I, so I, I I agree with with ninety eight percent of what Rick had to say, but I also think that to your question, this is a disastrous framing for Republicans and and the right because I think there's an instinctive revulsion against you're banning books, you are banning. You're, you're burning books. You're protecting children from words and ideas, but not from guns. This is one of the things that is driving people in swing states. You know, the, you know, educated college educated voters, but also you know, women suburban suburban women voters away from the party. This is a really indefensible position. Until five minutes ago, American conservatives were all in favor of free speech. Right? This is one of those when you're framing the issue. You know, they're, they're saying, we're all for free speech. We're against wokeness. We're against this. Then you turn on them and say, well, then why are you supporting using the power of the state to take books out of libraries? So the intensity emotionally may be on their side, but I think this is a disastrous issue. And, and the polling reflects this, that they're doing this. Now, I know that you didn't want to go in this direction, but I want to go back to my, my heart attack and, um, and, and, and cancer. If people um, understand this is there's there's it's two tracks. The right is pushing against what's happening on university campuses, where speakers are being shouted down, where there is a very specific political correctness on the campus, and there is this belief that words that you don't like are harm, that you are harmed by this, and this is widely accepted in liberal academic circles. And you'll see these discussions about free speech. And I have to say that one of the most concerning things I've seen has been that folks on the left have not been as vocal in defense of free speech and you know, including on university campuses. They can, because if they surrender the issue, then what you're going to see is what you have down in Florida, where the Mon for Liberty are going and saying, well, you know, we're just taking the arguments that you've already made that uh, that this speech is, you know, endangers me, that causes harm. So if it's good enough for you at Stanford University, then it's good enough for us. It's just a matter of who has the power. And so a lot of this argument is, you know, some of the people who were being appointed by Ron DeSantis, like Christopher Rufo, were saying, we're just going to use the same weapons that the left has used. That every single time there is a speaker shouted down for being a conservative on a campus, then what happens is the right says, well, when we get power, what are we going to do? We're going to shout down voices that we don't like, you know, and who's going to stop us? So I think this is a disastrous issue uh, for for the right. 
And also, I think it's also one of those that's easy to explain. When we started off by asking about the use of the word fascist, you don't need to use the word fascist. Just run through what Rick just said. They are banning books about Hank Aaron and Rosa Parks. And, and you know, your, your average normal American realizes how crazy this is. So this is an issue in which they are exposing themselves. So maybe short term, they have the intensity. Long term, I think it's horrific. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm very intense about it. Charlie, I'm going to stick with you for yeah. a minute. Um, if you, uh, everyone on this call, if you are not listening to the Bulwark podcast, of which Charlie is a host, go sign up, sign up for the newsletter. It is my go to daily podcast. Thank so you. I just had to say that. Um, so on your Bulwark podcast, you've highlighted a lot of journalists and historians yeah. who, are tr- and who are tracking. QAnon, conspiracy yes. theorists, the far right extremists, militia groups. This is a dark conversation yeah. right now. Um, I, I think it's really important that we bring this into this conversation yeah. to understand what is going on with um, with this extremist MAGA movement that we're in. So can you uh, yeah. tell us just a quick highlight how you think that impacts the GOP and um Okay, just start. Well, well, I mean, it goes it goes back to something Rick said, where, where you're you're seeing you know that MAGA devours the Tea Party and that MAGA is now being divided by be devoured by QAnon, and I think that one of the things you tried to highlight is that the people who are following what's been going on, because I think that our tendency is to sort of fight the last war, is to think that well you know Fox News is the center of all of this, but it's not any longer because there are this vast ecosystem. And it is becoming increasingly radicalized where you are seeing things, you know, Christian nationalism, um, you know, the the mainstreaming of the great replacement theory, the way in which religion has been distorted. And, and, and so there are themes out there that if you don't live in that world, you don't even understand what they're talking about. It feels like they're speaking in tongues, and yet it has this kind of impact. And I think it's one of the one of the reasons why a lot of us wake up feeling like we took crazy pills, because people are saying and they're doing things or they're reacting. You see Marjorie Taylor Greene, they're like, what the hell are they talking about? Well, it's because there is this vast um, movement out there with this, uh, w- with its own information ecosystem that is spreading extremely radical ideas, not just conspiracy-based, but racially-based, grievance-based things that would have been consigned to the far reaches of the fever swamp, you know, people mimeographing things and all caps in their mom's basement. And now they have websites and they have YouTube channels. And so I've had authors on who track this. And it's one of those things, you think it's bad. It's actually way worse than you think it is. And this is part of what we've been describing. It's been happening to the Republican Party where the Republican will say, okay, you know, I think I've covered myself because I'm I'm MAGA now. And then he, you know, goes to, you know, Waukesha County Republican women and finds out that MAGA isn't radical enough. You have to be QAnon. And then you adapt QAnon stuff. You have Elise Stefanik will throw stuff out about grooming and things like that. And then somebody else is going to come along and say, well, what about that? I mean, so they are really in a position of they keep growing these baby alligators of crazy and they're all growing up. And they're coming for them. Crazy alle- baby alligators. Okay. <laughs> Rick, do you want to add to that before we turn I do, to the 2023 I do. I, I do election? Say, I want to give you one piece of, well, not one piece, like maybe a couple, a uh, piece of, uh, of good news. A couple oh, years amen. ago, the single stupidest political phrase in the history of American politics came out. Single dumbest phrase I've ever heard in American politics, and that was defund the police. Oh, God. It instantaneously, when you put it in a focus group or in a survey, knocked between 15 and 25 points off a Democratic candidate. It was a nuclear bomb going off inside of, of, of the Democratic Party. There's good news, though. There's a better, stupider, worse, more radioactive phrase, and that is six week abortion ban. I have never in my career, I've been doing this since 1988, I've commissioned, I don't know. 1,500 surveys in my career, maybe more. I've never, ever seen anything that splits off independent and women voters from the Republican Party like the words six-week abortion ban. Dobbs was a 
Dobbs was an atomic bomb. Six week abortion bans that are passing all over the place, including in Florida, they are a whole bunch of ICBMs landing and setting off dozens of hydrogen bombs at one time. That is something you should take a little bit of heart from. And it's not just that it's about abortion, qua abortion. It's about, it, it's seen as a direct attack on personal liberty. And in Kansas, when they talked about the, the abortion ban there as an attack on personal liberty, it became a unbelievable political countervailing force against a lot of the lunacy the Republicans are pushing. Because one yeah. thing Charlie and I can tell you is yeah. Republicans always want to go back in the matrix. They want to go back to the nest. They always want to go home. They really want to go back to their party, even if they're like sick of it right now. This may be powerful enough to split some of them out in a really fundamental way. Go ahead. So, Charlie. no, the, the, the point um, about Kansas, I, I mean, I would recommend just go and study what they did in Kansas, how yeah. they messaged, how they reached out to people who might not have shared their values. They didn't insult them. They didn't show contempt for them. They, it's almost a textbook case of, of using people's values and to, to begin a conversation. Um, and it, it was, it's, it's one of the most, um, I don't know, I'm not, not sure who's behind it, but it was, it was one of the most skilled uh, cases of, of changing people's minds because they didn't go in saying, this is an attack on women. This is, this is a fascist movement. They said, okay, let's have, I am a pro-life pastor. This is why I object to this. Or I am, you know, a, a mother of, of three children. Or I, again, speaking to people where they were as opposed to beating them over the head. And you don't get that a lot in American politics. I think they, the one thing that we've, we've learned, I think, I think it was, it's Arthur Brooks who said, you know, one of the most powerful weapons in politics is, is contempt. That the moment that someone thinks that you have contempt for them or that you're insulting them, they just shut you down. The people in Kansas figured out how to talk about abortion in a way that created a shockingly big tent, to use your phrase. Mm -hmm. Yes, very effective. And that's that's maybe the um, Democratic Party of Florida could go learn a lesson or two. Um, let's turn to the 23-24 election cycle. And um, first, I would love to hear what your organizations are going to be doing um, in 23-24 and you know, do you guys work together? Um, and also, I think we need to understand um, how the Lincoln Project might be supporting Kamala, since you guys do such great messaging um, uh, around the success of the Biden administration. So okay. whoever wants to go first, go for it. Charlie, you go first. No, no, no. I, 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 don't, have, I don't have as good an answer as you're going to have on this. <laughs> <laughs> well, so at the Lincoln Project, obviously, we were very successful in 2020 in the big task, which was defeating Donald Trump. We were not as successful in breaking the movement, this authoritarian movement underneath him mm -hmm. as we should have been. We should have focused on it more, freely admit it. Um, we have a unique skill set in peeling off a limited number of Republican voters who are disaffected from the party. We know how to talk to them. We know how to speak their language culturally, much like those Kansas ads. We know how to appeal to elements of their lives that 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 help move them away and let them step away briefly. We're not asking them to convert and become progressives. We're not asking them to change everything they believe. We're asking them to put America over Donald Trump. We will be doing that again in 24. In 23, we are going to, um, if I can just put it as bluntly as I can, we're going to take a big boat out in the middle of Lake Republican and throw chum in the water to make the sharks fight each other. I want Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis to have a long, bloody, horrifying primary. We've always believed that Trump will be the, the nominee in the end of the day. We've always believed that, that, that no matter what the other you know, wannabes thought they were going to put together as a campaign, at the end of the day, the party loves the guy. The base loves the guy. At the end of the day, Rupert may be pissed off at him, but Fox will go back to covering him 24 seven. Um, and we've always felt like that was gonna be the, the inevitable outcome. And so we have to prepare ourselves for a race that, that people may not want. They may not want Trump versus Biden. There are a lot of things I don't want, yeah. but I have to deal with them as reality. And so 
we've been preparing for a for a Trump Biden contest. One of the things we're going to do because the Democrats cannot take a victory lap for their lives. They don't understand how to take credit for good things that they accomplish. Um, we're going to help lift up some of that record. We're going to help denature and defang some of those Republican attacks on crime and culture war things. Uh, I'll give you an example of that. When the infrastructure bill passed, which, as the president would say, is a BFD, we did the first ad in the country on the infrastructure bill. And I called somebody at the White House, and I, they were like, wow, we didn't, we would have never thought to do that. I was like, I know. So they, they have a real trouble. They have a real problem taking credit. Um, they have a real problem uh, lifting up their own guy. They have a real problem unifying behind their own guy. We Hopefully, we'll help on that. We will continue to batter Trump uh, on three different levels, dividing off what we call the Bannon line voters. Steve Bannon named them uh, by in 2020. He said, if these Lincoln Project, you know what's can take three to 8% of Trump's vote away, he can't win. And my response was, hold my beer. Um, we're going to take away more this time. And that's primarily because of two big factors, Dobbs and January 6th. Those two things in, in, the, in the work we've done those have been driven a wedge in the more traditional, more affluent, tend to be more female Republican voters. That three to eight percent we now model as between seven and eleven or twelve percent, depending Ooh. on the state. We're going to peel as many of those people off as we can. We're going to we're going to try to do what we did last time and psychologically go to war with Donald Trump. We were able to make him fire his campaign manager to fight with us when he should have been fighting with Joe Biden. Uh, to distract and, and 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 drive him out of his mind. Will that work again? It might. We have to do it to see. Uh, he's got a much better campaign team than he had in the past. That's something everybody should be cautious about. And it's something the Lincoln Project is very cautious about. Um, we're building up the resources to go out into the states uh, with media, message, communication, and with our 62,000 volunteers uh, who were very active in 22, including in Wisconsin and other places. Um, and we'll also be working in some of the key Senate races in the in the 22 cycle, uh, because a lot of these states will have an overlap of presidential and Senate races that are enormously consequential, Arizona being the peak of that mountain. So that's, that's the quick and dirty of 2024 for us. Are you going to be doing any pro-Kamala uh, work, do you think? We did a couple of spots in 20 uh, that were pro-Kamala, and, uh, and, you know, we'll see how, we'll see how the the campaign is rolling. It also depends on who Trump picks as his vice presidential nominee. If it's okay. Ron DeSantis, we can have a lot of fun with that. If it's if it's if it's Elise Stefanik, we can have uh, we can draw another contrast there. But you know, the real the real talk about vice presidential candidates is they can hurt you more than they can help you. As a rule, um, I hope that the party can come together and be a little less negative on her. She's an interesting political character because when she gets at bat and, and, and connects, it's like grand slam home runs, but she's got a batting average of like 0.12. And it's just not, it, it's not, she doesn't connect like that as often as she, as it would be beneficial for her to do. Yeah. Charlie, how about you? What's going to happen to the bulwark for 23, 24? Well, we have a very different role than than the Lincoln Project. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I I see our role as political commentary. Um, and and one of the things that that I'm going to continue to do is I'm going to continue to tell the Democrats that they need to be talking to the voters who will actually decide the election, um, as opposed to simply scratching their ids or creating a safe space. That they are going to have to be able to communicate. Um, that they are going to have to run centrists in many of these districts. And so I will continue to talk about this. I see in your in the in in the chat that somebody is uh, is suggesting that I made a false equivalency uh, between college students shouting down students and 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 what the government is doing. This is the kind of thinking on the left that is going to uh, have negative consequences because it's not a false equivalency. It's saying, you can have two thoughts in your head at the same time. You can understand that what they are doing is awful, but if we are going to uh, combat illiberalism or fascism, we cannot tolerate illiberalism or fascism on our side. 
you know, bad actors on our side or extreme politics on our side will get you another term of Donald Trump. So uh, one of the things that I do in my commentaries occasionally, um, and, you know, the, I put this in the tough love category, is tell Democrats, if you, you know, for example, go out and try to rationalize defund police, this is how you are going to lose key elections. Um, the Democratic Party in Wisconsin did an outstanding job in the last election. They reelected a governor who was one of the least charismatic figures we have ever had. The Democrats turned out very impressively, and yet they managed to lose to Ron Johnson. Why did they lose to Ron Johnson? Well, there were people like, there was commentators of the bulwark. I mean, we don't see our job as being political partisans or flax or, you know, um, you know, you know, cheerleaders said, if you nominate someone who has been associated with defund police, you will lose this Senate seat. You have to choose between ideological purity and taking out the most vulnerable Republican. This was one of those cases when, and, and by the way, a lot of Democrats said, no, 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 you shouldn't have criticized them. This is the future. And, I, and Rick and I have talked about this. You know, there, there are candidates that the Democrats can nominate in Florida or elsewhere who will take them down to defeat. And um, I know that a lot of folks, including on this call, don't want to hear this. But you have to ask yourself, how do we get to the moment we're at right now? What is it that you have been saying? What kind of candidates have you been presenting so that we are going into 2024 with a very real possibility of having MAGA dominance in many of the states in the country and Donald Trump returning? So um, one of the things that I'm going to do, I mean, look, the, the, the bulwark has a diversity of opinion. You know, the stuff that I write is not the same as what others write. Um, Mona Charon is not JVL. JVL is not Tim Miller. Tim Miller does not say the same things as, as Sarah Longwell. I am not a particular Biden or Kamala fanboy, but I'm going to make the, the point that this is an existential choice and that whatever uh, problems you have with Joe Biden being you know, too old or too liberal or too centrist or whatever it is, it comes down to what are you prepared to do to keep Donald Trump from coming back into power? So you know, we have been making the case to centrist conservative voters that Donald Trump represents a violation of everything you believe in. Right. That, that, for example, I mean, going back to something Rick was talking about earlier, you know, conservatives have always believed in, in free enterprise and, you know, and private, in private property. Then Ron DeSantis comes along and says, no, I'm going to use the power of government to beat up on private businesses for saying things I disagree with. Now, you need to remind conservatives, you know, what do you believe? What are your principles? How has he trashed this? Or remind conservatives that used to believe in exceptional, you know, American exceptionalism and our role as a leader in the world. When you turn on Fox News and up until this week, hear Tucker Carlson or Ron DeSantis or Donald Trump talking about how we should abandon Ukraine. So we need to kind of hold up a mirror to the voters and say, is this who you are? This is what you believed before. So this is one of the themes that I'm going to do. And, you know, it, it may sound like negative partisanship. Um, I'm not going to, you know, be telling people that, hey, you know, um, Democratic Party is going to ride to uh, victory with President Kamala Harris, because I don't believe that's true. And I'm sorry, I'm going to tell you what I actually believe. And I think this is going to be a real problem. Right now, let me tell you what the Republican strategy is going to be, and I'm be interested to know if Rick disagrees with me. They're basically going to run um, against dead Joe Biden, live Kamala Harris. They're already saying he's yeah. not going to make it through the term. You vote for Joe Biden, you get Kamala Harris. I mean, this is something that is going to have to be be, be dealt with here. So, um, I, I, you know, that is I, Charlie. Yeah. I completely agree with you on that. I mean, to give you, I mean, and one of the things we've done this year at LP is we've gone out and we've done a lot of research and studied where the where the salient messaging points are, where the valences are, where messaging is working and not working um, with Republican voters so that we can keep peeling them off. Hmm. And one of the things we discovered is, you know, it, it's not a coincidence that you have this, this 
emerging framework around Biden in the messaging from the Republicans. And it is Biden is corrupt, the Biden crime family, right. Hunter's laptop, all the crazy stuff, right? Biden is too old, too weak, too tired. That is, he is, and, and honestly, a lot of his Democratic allies have not been as helpful as they could be in pushing back on that. Right. It's real, but it's also not helpful. Republicans are great at covering up any any flaw in their candidate while highlighting the guy, the other guy. And it, it doesn't idea. help when they're able to say, hey, a Democrat said the other day he was too old, and this guy said he should run. And Gavin Newsom said that he should, you know. Anyway, so he's corrupt, he's old, he has let America slid, slide into a, you know, Mad Max hellscape of crime and poverty and drugs, all the things that that stoke the fears of the 65 plus demo they really need to hold on yeah. to. And finally, there is an idea out there on the Republican side, and I'll be very direct with you, the, the, the racial element of it is only about yay far under the surface. Oh, yeah. not so. That, that she is a black radical, that she mm. is Antifa, that she is BLM, that she is part of this dangerous thing that's coming to take away the white America that they all love. It's not subtle. It's grotesque. Um, and, and you will see that become more and more expansive as the campaign goes on. Yeah. Um, and, and Charlie's right. They are, they're trying to say, oh, do you want Kamala Harris to pick the, the, yeah. the, the next Supreme Court justice? Exactly. I've seen that one starting to pop up in their, in their chatter. And so it really is something that, and again, we've spent a lot of, of time this year preparing the battlefield and studying how these things work. And that if, if I were running against him, I know where I'd go. It's the same thing they're doing. They have to maximize their base population and their base turnout. Yeah. And I want to go back and echo one other thing that Charlie talked about that I think is important for Democrats in 2024. Democrats are losing three key demographics right now mm -hmm. that if they continue to lose those three key demographics, their future as a national party is in danger. First, working class whites have been fading away from the Democratic Party since 1984. Why? They don't trust them. They don't believe in them. They are told lies in their mind, and they're told, oh, yeah, don't worry. We're going to close the steel mill, but you'll all get jobs being retrained as solar panel installers. The deep, profound skepticism of white working class voters is a, is a massive problem for Democrats. They are losing Hispanic yeah. voters at a pace that should terrify them. And they have not adjusted their messaging to address that problem. And if you think Hispanic voters, because they are Hispanic, are necessarily progressive, you have not been to South Florida, and you have not been to the Rio Grande Valley, and you've not been to Maricopa County in Arizona, and you've not been to Clark County in Nevada. They are not progressives. They are culturally conservative. They are economically liberal and moderate. Democrats need to get on the stick and stop treating them as one cohesive group and start talking to the individual broken out segments of the Hispanic population. It is a five alarm fire. And the final place that they're starting to lose voters, and, and there's very little they can do about it right now, is African-American men. Now, that's just starting. It's not where working class whites are. It's not where Hispanics are. We are starting to see motion among African-American men, especially African-American men who are in the middle class. And it is a it is a warning sign. It is a, it is a red light starting to flash for the Democrats. Why is it? They've been patronizing. Uh, they have they have been they've they've talked down to these voters for too long. They've treated them like they're automatically going to vote for them, taken them for granted. And it is a, there's a lot of work to be done in those three spaces. It's all addressable. It's all fixable. Um, but it takes a uh, it takes a, a dedication at the top level of the party to do that and to start. And to stop taking people for granted and start talking to people in language and and in in a tone that they understand. So agree, agree. Off my soapbox. Yeah, I yeah. Agree. No, that's a good soapbox to get on. No. Um, we're over time, and I just want to say, um, um, thank you so much to Gail for pulling this together, and for Rick and Charlie for giving us your valuable time. Um, we may have to get you back uh, in 2024 because you. Uh, 
gave us a lot to think about, a lot to process, and we just so appreciate both of you and what your organizations are doing in this fight to save our democracy. And I do hope that everyone, I'm gonna end on a moment of hope. Um, I do hope everyone in your community, in your state, go find a voter registration or get out the vote organization because that is what it's going to be. We've really got to mobilize people to show up and vote and to care about saving uh, the country we all love. So on that note, I can't thank you all enough. Rick, Charlie, honestly, this has been like such thank an you. honor for this hour. Well, and um, everyone, you. If you have any questions, um, I'm at rick at therickwilson.com um, and, and happy to answer any questions you might have. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And everyone, thanks, thanks for everybody. coming to Big Tent. Right. Have a great Thank night. You. Thank you. Bye, guys.